to The Octarine Tree, a podcast exploring the meaning of ecology, spirit and human relationship. From Southwestern Australia, I'm your host, Byron Joel. Hello and welcome to The Octarine Tree podcast, episode two, Adventures in Crypto Hominology. <laughs> crypto Hominology. I'm very excited about today because I got to interview uh, someone who I've kind of considered a bit of an intellectual mentor for some time, a non-local one, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Dr. Meldrum is a professor of anatomy and anthropology and a professor of the Department of Anthropology at Idaho State University. He's also adjunct professor of occupational and physical therapy, and he's a world expert on foot morphology and locomotion in primates. His very specialty is the evolution of bipedal locomotion in primates. But he's perhaps most well known for, in terms of internet land, for his work around the Sasquatch phenomena. Yeti, Sasquatch, uh, the Almas, the Almaste, the Yowie even, as we discuss in this this episode. Um, All these creatures in cryptozoology that he and others refer to as relict hominoids. Um, I actually did a video or two or three on relict hominoids, different ideas surrounding them and introduction to them. And another video focusing on the area around Southeast Asia, including Australia, Australasia, Indonesia, and Eastern Asia itself, and the natural history of hominids in that area. Um, asking the question, is it scientifically plausible that a pre-sapiens or non-sapiens, extra-sapiens hominid species or hominin species crossed the Wallace line and entered the Australian mainland before or near the beginning of the colon- colonisation of Australia by Homo sapiens some 50, 60 or 70,000 years ago? So. I was lucky enough to convince Dr. Meldrum to jump on and have a chat with me. Um, You may know him, he's been on Joe Rogan, he's got a pretty large internet presence as far as crypto hominology goes. Why do I find that word so funny? And he's uh, the author of a few books, Uh, all of this will be in the show notes. He's a wonderful guy, very, very charming, uh, chival man and got a serious brain on him. So without further ado, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Dr. Jeff Meldrum joining us from Idaho in the United States. How do you do? Fine, thank you. I hope you're uh, staying sane amidst all the relative chaos in your corner of the planet at the moment. That must be quite a strange thing to actually be there at the moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, on, on all different fronts. The pandemic, the politics, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mad world right at the moment. Yeah, it is really. It, um, I'm blessed in that I'm in southwestern Australia, which is in Perth, is the most isolated capital city on the planet. Right. And uh, our little sleepy corner of the world seems to stay a sleepy, quiet, safe, stable little corner of the world no matter what's going on. So it, um, I, do, uh, I do hope it's not as quite as stressful as the media is making out in the US at the moment. Well, well thankfully, Pocatello, like Perth, but probably but on a different scale, is in a kind of a little bit of a backwater mm. here in the Rocky Mountains and in one of the uh, you know lesser populated states. Although fast growing, our our western side of the state is uh, burgeoning with uh, California expatriates. So as long as they stay on that side of the state. <laughs> okay, well let's let's jump into the uh, hominid hominoid topics. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm in Australia, obviously, as you can tell by my drawling accent. Yeah, um, love it. <laughs> we were always taught that, you know, Australia was separated from Gondwana and the rest of well, any other continent. It's its own uh, continent island uh, from about 40 million years ago that it's been evolving in isolation. And we have a very, very different and rich and diverse ecosystem. I mean, the, the geology is different. The topography is different. The hydrology is different. Therefore, the ecology that evolved here is very different. It's 
marsupial dominated, eucalyptus dominated, et cetera, et cetera. It is the strangest continent on the planet, okay. second only to Antarctica. Yep. And we were also taught in in high school uh, biology about the Wallace line. Right. This line the, between Asia, or what was known as the Sunda plate. Right. In an old Pleistocene <clears throat> geological terms, the Sunda plate and Australia or the Sahul plate. And we were told that large species, particularly of mammals, don't cross that line. So on the on the Asian side, it's all Southeast Asian or Eurasian species. You've got your your rhinoc- uh, pygmy rhinoceri, you've got your big cat predators, you've got monkeys, etc. And on the Australian side, the Sahul side, it's the classically Australasian species of marsupials and monotremes and whatnot. And there's a little bit of bleeding back and forth, and I'm probably telling you things you already know, but for the sake of the audience, this area called Wallacea, there is a bit of back and forth with species there, but it's usually bats, insects, birds. So when it comes to the Yawi law in Australia, which is considerable, Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how deep a dive you've taken into the anecdote. At least the anecdote. There doesn't seem to be so much physical evidence. Right. Not so many footprints. Not so much hair, scat, even photographs for that matter. Right. But the photograph. Uh, sorry, the anecdotal evidence from the sightings of people is considerable. And uh, I'll cut to the chase. What do you think the chances are that some kind of non-sapien hominid or extra sapien hominid as i call it mm-hmm. could have possibly crossed the wallace line at some point prior to the colonizing of the continent via sapiens some which is now considered some 50 60 perhaps even seventy thousand years ago yeah well i have to preface uh, my my speculations um, with the, the the caveat that you're right, I haven't taken uh, as deep a dive as as I need to at some point. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, in my book Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, uh, I kind of uh, skirted that issue altogether. And uh, because I'm, uh, it, it, there still are a lot of, of unknowns, as you point out. Um, my forte is the footprints, and I've had the privilege of, of uh, seeing a few examples. Tony Healy made a pass through here and, and brought some specimens. I've, I've met and, and visited and discussed these topics with uh, Paul Cropper and, and, mm. um, and, and their writings are those that I'm mo- most familiar with. And, and, uh, and those footprints were a bit uh, ambiguous, a bit indeterminate. I mean, there were some titillating things, but, Boy, I get sent a lot of pictures of would-be Yowie prints that look to me decidedly uh, wallaby-like or uh, other other animals or, or even even humans. And um, and in addition to that, the anecdotal evidence, while rich, is is by my estimation remarkably diverse. There isn't a consistent thread of of uh, you know one morphotype like there is with Sasquatch. I mean, you get the outliers once in a while. You get the supposed dog men and, and of course, little people and so forth, which may just be infant or juvenile Sasquatch, who knows. But but the the, the type of descriptions there are, are quite uh, wide uh, widely diverse. And, you know, I, I'm, I reflect on the cover illustration that, that, uh, that Paul selected for his book with this oversized, creature with uh, you know three digits uh, with claws not nails and and that kind of thing uh, as well as the many footprints that have been uh, of, of, of questionable footprints that have been associated makes me wonder if you know nature has this remarkable uh, propensity for convergence um, I often show my students the remarkable similarities in morphology between representative placental mammals and marsupial mammals that have come to occupy similar niches. So you've got the marsupial wolf, the marsupial cat, the, the burr, a uh, burrower, the, the gnar, the, you know, the small carnivores, the, uh, you know, you name it, the ricochetal, the you know, equivalent to the cursorial species and so on. 
So you have to wonder um, what besides the tree wallaby or besides the the uh, possums and gliders has converged on the primate niche, especially the hominoid niche. You know, there, I once came across a, a, a very fanciful <laughs> and imaginative sketch of, of one interpretation of the Yowie, which basically made a, a gorilla with a pouch, <laughs> essentially, yeah. with like a gorilla-like kangaroo. And, um, I, you know, I wonder what the prospects of, of that explanation are. The other, the only other alternative, as you point out, is crossing the Wallace line. And for a hominoid, you know, a, a, a something ancestral form of, of, uh, of great ape having made it across that boundary, that barrier is, uh, it seems rather unlikely. I don't think it's until, I mean, there's been some titillating um, suggestions of uh, of dispersal of things as early as, uh, you know, as, as Homo erectus in Southeast Asia. Certainly, perhaps, not certainly, but but much more likely by Homo heidelbergensis. And then mm. there might have been some more archaic forms of human in the broadest sense prior to the arrival of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. And, um, so that raises some interesting, uh, you know, I was, I was, again, I was intrigued. There was a, a television serial, uh, here that, uh, featured the furries, I think they were called, um, uh, based on the tradition in Australia of a human species, but one that was quite intelligent. And I mean, basically it was a recasting of, of the social and racial uh, struggles that other ethnicities have, have uh, experienced in other continents and in other cultures and and countries, but but yeah. but taking the question from a perspective of of one of more of a of a uh, pre- perceived evolutionary disparity rather of, of grade rather than one of ethnicity of of species, and so yeah. So, okay, I think I chased my tail around the bat. I mean, I, I really don't know. I don't know what to make of it. I haven't found that common thread that I can pull and tug and see what's at the end of it. Yes, and you, make, you do make a good point when you uh, brought up the, the difference in, in the types that are described in the anecdote in Australia. And, I mean, there are different types that are described in other places around the world. Right. However, Australia... The Yowie law, the contemporary Yowie law, as well as the the Aboriginal Indigenous law, it, there is a huge difference in the types that are described. I mean, you've got you've got the little guys and the big guys, and that you know that's not too uncommon. But then amongst the big guys, you've got everything from very ape like all the way through to very sapiens like right. with some more or less superficial differences in size and facial structure and you know hair etc and then you've even got you've got descriptions of footprints with three toes right and you know it, it does get quite strange and I've that's been noted before yeah in the past but I still I can't shake the quantity of the anecdote and oh, right. the, the quality of the descriptions. I mean, I've listened to hundreds of these recordings now. There's a group online called Yowie Hunters and they have a YouTube channel and there's a couple of hundred now of really good interviews of people claiming to have seen something. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm no walking human lie detector. Right. Okay. However, my alarm bells in terms of people not telling the truth have only gone off a couple of times listening to a couple of hundred of these anecdotes some of them are extreme extremely compelling right. and you, i get the feeling with most of them that the people while perhaps they have been confused and they're misidentifying what they're seeing they're nevertheless very genuine about what they've seen right and this goes all the way back to the indigenous pre colonial era and indeed the colonial era where you've got the newspaper cuttings and all those kind of things the question if it's not a flesh and blood if it's not the most obvious you know Occam's razor flesh and blood bipedal primate then what the heck is going on I mean that's an even stranger 
uh, discussion. Right, and and you 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 make a very good point, and I'm I'm certainly I would emphasize that I'm I'm not uh, uh, eager to or rushing to dismiss or discard the whole affair because of of an apparent lack of consistency. I mean, uh, and you know I I have to resist the uh, tendency maybe to um, you know I don't think I I resort to cherry picking, but but to um, be uh, the the, the um, notion of being more skeptical of things that don't seem to fit the pattern, and so it's a self reinforcing hmm. process. You know, it's like people are constantly saying, "Well, I saw a footprint with four toes," or "I saw a footprint with three toes," and um, you know, more more often than not, and almost exclusively, if they have documented those, there it's quickly evident that I mean, you know most reports of three-toed tracks aren't tracks period there's something mm. the potholes that have right. resemblance and 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 sasquatch i mean i have documented <clears throat> some some tracks that i have cast myself where when they're walking on the flat they push off from the front part of their foot and as a result their fourth and fifth toes sometimes leave a very faint impression right. and i have i can pull out a cast that i've made myself that looks like it only has four toes but in the next yeah. footprint <clears throat> there's five toes as clear as could be uh, there. So, you know, you, you come back to, I mean, this, this raises the issue. Um, uh, recently we had a, a paper that was submitted to the relic hominoid inquiry that I edited and, and, uh, and was published and it was a fascinating one. And uh, we actually had several interesting commenters also address it. And um, uh, no, I've got that backwards. In this case, I was an invited commenter they actually published it in a different journal. I was disappointed they didn't go with ours. Right. But in any case, it was about eyewitness testimony. And, you know, there's been <clears throat> a lot of uh, influence by the work of Elizabeth Loftus, who uh, is, uh, you know, has some notoriety for her, her work in the, um, in the judication arena um, her expert testimony about the unreliability of eyewitness testimony, basically. Right. And um, one of the interesting aspects of this paper was in the they, they drew attention to the fact that in the past 20 years, actually, there's been a, a bit of reversal by some members of that uh, call uh, uh, um, collection of psychologists, etc., behaviorists, and so on. Um, that eyewitness testimony can be very reliable under the proper circumstances and um, and given uh, certain criteria regarding the observer. But um, one of my <clears throat> one of my uh, uh, remarks in my comments was that um, you know I agree that one of my uh, one of my points raised was that. Um, well, an example I offered, you know, it's one thing to suggest that, say, an, an elderly lady who was mugged and her purse was snatched uh, is there confronted with a police lineup of potential suspects. And she's trying to recall, based on these all you know, very similar appearing individuals, which was the one versus a potential eyewitness of, of Sasquatch or a, a relic hominoid who's confronted with a lineup of a wolf and a bear and a moose and a backpacker and a big sled. Yeah, I mean, it, it's apples and oranges in, in a way. And, and I, I tried to make that argument with a, another person on, um, on an interview uh, caller one time. And more so in Australia. I mean, in North America and Eurasia, you have black bear and brown bear. You have moose i mean i'm not sure if i think if i'd confuse a moose for a sasquatch but there you go you know the body size the bulk is yes, there exactly in australia we've got there's homo sapiens yep and there's kangaroo right and you know the, the kangaroo it does have some attributes you, you look at the upper half Right, the torso, yeah. especially of a large male buck kangaroo, yeah. and it's quite, it, you know, humanoid-ish. You know, you yes. can you can see the, with the exception you know, of those uh, <laughs> rabbit ears. <laughs> and as soon as it starts moving, or it it's turns. obvious that its locomotion is completely different to any right. bipedal, uh, upright, bipedal hominid 
Right. You know, it, ba- it bounces on two legs, obviously. In saying that, though, I can't help but be overwhelmed by the quantity of very striking <laughs> anecdote. There is that lack of physical evidence or relative compared to the North American phenomena. But we were always told the, the one reason that it couldn't happen here in Australia was because of the Wallace line. Right. We now, we now know that there were, there are hominid species mm-hmm. that have crossed the Wallace line. Right. Homo floresiensis crossed right. the Wallace line. Yep. Um, and the morphology of floresiensis is, is striking, as I'm sure you know. Like once a, people, when it was first discovered, pe- the, no one knew what they were looking at. What, was it a single pathological individual? Right. Uh, then when so, when they realized it was a whole community, it was like, okay, well, obviously it's, you know, a, a population of Homo erectus and they found themselves on an island and they've been dwarfed. And now the, the morphology, the cladistic suggests that it's perhaps even, it's more reminiscent of habilis or something even exactly. more archaic. Yes. And then you've, they've discovered Homo luzonensis or, well, they've discovered some phalanges, I think, yeah. of of another diminutive hominid, right, <clears throat> which is in the Philippines, which technically isn't across the Wallace line, but there is a large body of water to cross. Right. Now, now we know that Java man has been right next door to Australia in Java. I mean, geologically speaking, it's it's across a continental divide, but it's, you know, it's a skip and a hop across the pond, so to speak, especially at the glacial maximum when the the coastlines were closer together. Right. So in a world where we know hominids can cross the Wallace line, we have at least one example, and Java man was in Java up to a million years ago. I think it's they've said 700,000 to a million years is the dating. I don't see why it's not possible that a species of not not – like really archaic Paranthropocene or Australopithecine, argue, but a, hom- a hominid, a pre-sapiens homogeneous or very similar could have crossed the Wallace line. And then especially if you take into account again the, the fossil record per species that is recognised by the fossil record, how many do you think there are that existed that, that have not been discovered, have not been recognised? Right. So it may be my enthusiasm uh, talking me into it, but I suggest that it's actually quite plausible right. that a population of some hominid, a pre-sapiens homogeneous or very similar described or undescribed species once upon a time crossed the Wallace line. Right. No, I agree. I think I think the discovery of the hobbit, Homo floresiensis, really, uh, you know, kind of uh, raised all kinds of interesting possibilities and, and pointed to the remarkable gaps that we currently have. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I was one of those who advocated that, that this was a more, ha- at least habilis, if not Australop- outright Australopithecine. I was right. asked to, to review the, the uh, initial description, the paper in, in nature of the, of the uh, skeletal morphology and, and drew attention to those remarkably archaic features that you know, that don't comport with a, the model of a uh, dwarfed Homo erectus. So that was, was that evident to you just by citing the morphology without like running a cladistic, yeah. the cladistics in a program? Oh, yeah. I mean, there were things that, I mean, there were aspects of the skeleton that looked almost chimpanzee-like in some regards. And do you think, but there seemed to be a reluctance to go there early on. Do you think that was just out of sheer disbelief and and the entropy and conservativeness of the scientific community? Well, I think it was, I think there was some polarization, but it was largely fueled by, you know, one uh, one or two individuals on the microcephaly uh, um, uh, side of the argument. And, and they're still, he's still beating that drum in spite of remarkable uh, you know, morphometric, GMF, uh, geomorphometric analyses of the cranium that clearly shows that it has nothing to do with, with Homo sapiens or Homo erectus and that it has the greatest affinities to early Havilene, which are essentially, I mean, the line, the boundary between late Australopithecine and Homo habilis or so. I mean, it's just a matter of, of a slight 
slight increase in cranial capacity. And if, if, it, if it were up to you, where would you err on the side? What, what, what genus would you describe or would you fit them in if it were up to you? Well, I, I, well, I mean, I, it, I'm still, I, I criticized from the beginning. And, and every time I put it in print, I put the, the genus homo in, in air quotes because right. I don't think, I mean, I think the basis for that, it has the brain the size of a chimpanzee. It, right. it, it, the uh, the uh, argument that was made for the associated archaeological remains was so thin. I mean, those extremely crude tools, which we we now know that uh, Australopithecines were making flake tools even prior to Homo habilis. Right. And so, the, you know, and and the uh, the the notion of uh, of uh, controlled fire use was a very very tentative uh, demonstration based on the archaeological record of that cave site. I mean, it could just as well have been, you know, charcoal from from periodic uh, brush fires that uh, that uh, mm. uh, were in there. So I I was uh, always very dubious. I found found the the designation of, of Homo very dubious, very doubtful of it. And uh, so yeah, but I mean, you know, teetering on that boundary somewhere in, in that vicinity, I think it it, uh, it is a fair. But but you're right, then it shows a dispersal, a very early grade of hominin out of Africa. I mean, if our if our other the point that we're the other dot that we're connecting is is back in Africa at least two million years ago, you know, what has happened in between? It's a, it's it's a, a remarkable possibility. I mean, at this point, you just never say never. Exactly. Well, once upon a time, it felt safe to say never. But yeah. since that's what I love about Floresiensis, uh, Luzonensis, and the Denisovan. Right. Okay. Like a Hollywood script writer wouldn't dare be so cliche and obvious to write that uh, the the tip of a little pinky finger of all okay. of all the remains, yeah. the tip of a little pinky finger and a tooth in a cave right. would yield the description of an un entirely unrecognized species right up until that point now if the if that one discovery can open that kind of door and luzonensis yeah. and floresiensis one cave you know you know one site in in the philippines one cave in uh, siberia like it, who knows what's out there now oh, i made yeah. a vi- i made a little video where i kind of just satiated the more kind of sci-fi fantasy part of myself just asking the question i mean modern anatomically modern humans have been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back now it's somewhere around the three hundred thousand year right. mark i think with the discoveries of north in morocco some years ago right uh that's a that's a long time yeah. for homo sapiens or their immediate predecessors to be living c- contemporaneously with not only the species that we recognize in the fossil record, yeah. but again, I ask the question for every species that is recognized, how many more right. were there contemporaneous to that, that known species living in the world? Like right. what I, I, and I'm actually asking the question, how many do you think? Yeah. Bob, Bob Martin did, uh, as a primatologist, did a interesting uh, uh, analysis, uh, which he published in, in one of his books that, where he basically <clears throat> compared and contrasts paleo communities of, of various uh, uh, taxonomic groups of mammals and so forth with their uh, contemporary, their their current vicars, you know, their current representatives, and he came up with an estimate which he he felt comfortable applying at least to um, you know to other primates, perhaps not hominoids, but given um, you know the distinctions in natural history parameters, but but he um, he s- indicated that our primate fossil record probably only samples between six to eight percent of the actual taxonomic diversity that that existed. And so, even if you go real conservative and say we've only sampled half of the hominoid, I mean, I mean, who would have guessed that uh, just twenty years ago that we'd have almost what now it's over a hundred species of extinct hominoid throughout the Miocene and into the Pliocene, you know, so it's, um, uh, who's to say that we're, we're not going to, and, and that that pace is not going to, 
uh, keep up with the hominins as well. I mean, gee, when you look at the trajectory uh, over the past uh, 50 years, over the, you know, the course of my career, it's just been amazing. Yeah, and the last few years were very exciting. It was funny, yeah. it was up into kind of around before COVID hit. It seemed that every couple of months there was a jaw-dropping discovery, including a Denisovan jaw. Yeah. Um, I remember I was doing a talk. I did a I actually did a talk on introduction to the relic hominoid theory. And I swear in, in the six months that I was slowly preparing the PowerPoint, I had to go and amend what I was writing every kind of six weeks yeah. because of these discoveries. Um, and that, again, that's what I love about Floresiensis, Luzonensis, um, uh, is that they're, homin, they're hominin yep. and they've opened up people's minds to the potential diversity. So if you look at, you look at another family like the Canids, very similar in many ways, but also very different across the board. I mean, everything from foxes to to wolves to you know the domesticated variety. You've got the African dogs. You've got da 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 da. You've got pack hunters. A lot of pack hunters. You've got solitary species. You've got big. You've got small, etc. There's no reason to suggest that the Homo genus or the hominins couldn't have been as diverse and that the beauty of floresiensis i remember when reading an article only a couple of years after their discovery was um, announced it was by an anthropologist just saying that any anthropologist now worth their salt has to go and reconsider the law of little people right. and indeed big people Right, and then you've got these Luzonensis with its curved phalanges, suggesting that it was at least partially arboreal. Right. I mean, who knows the actual like the diversity of form and function and character and culture and intelligence right. that was going on. Yes, and and the other side of that coin, what what you're describing is this this ever bushier family tree with taxonomic diversity. But the other side of that coin is which Floresiensis also demonstrated is the recency of persistence of many of these branches that uh, uh, through, through uh, you know, novel discovery, but also through uh, increasing um, clarification of the duration in the, in the fossil record. So, you know, you mentioned uh, Java man uh, uh, persisting up till, uh, I don't remember which what figure you put out there about three hundred. He was for, no Java man was dated as far back as a million. I'm not sure oh, when it persisted. Far back, to. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Well, because one of the uh, discoveries that I found very intriguing concerning Java, because there's been a lot of debate about the how recent uh, it ranges anywhere from twenty five thousand to about seventy five thousand, uh, depending on the study. But there was a, a story where a fishing boat pulled up this dredge net. And there in the net was a was a, a, a mandible, which was later identified attributed to Homo erectus. And there was there was some contention whether it was Homo erectus or maybe a later later iteration like Homo heidelbergensis or some some of its ilk. But nevertheless, it was only it was dated to ten thousand years ago. So you know if you stepped in a time machine and just went back twenty thirty thousand years, you could have met Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis. Definitely Homo heidelbergensis. Um, there's a question about this. Uh, uh, what is it, the reindeer, reindeer cave? Red deer cave. Red deer. Well, cave. Yes. Red deer cave. I mean, that's uh, eleven thousand to right. fifteen thousand years old. Yeah. They don't. They still don't. They haven't attributed a species to that. Yet. They don't know right. what red deer cave is. They don't. Yeah. Exactly. Whether it's just a, a, a regional variant of Homo sapiens or or um, or some other other species, but. And then you probably had, like you mentioned, Denisovans as well, which mm. seems to be the Neanderthal, the Eastern Neanderthal clade. You know, yeah. although the, the tooth that you mentioned has been described as being very robust, large as an Australopithecine tooth. Yes. So, I mean, Neanderthals had pretty big jaws, but their teeth weren't as big as an Australopithecine. So it makes you wonder if there was this kind of um, character displacement, this niche partitioning of this uh, Neanderthaloid grade of, mm. uh, of, uh, uh, of existence, of behavior and morphology with one becoming more megadontia, megadont mm. uh, in some fashion, 
or or retaining those primitive traits from from earlier who knows but so we we and we did that, that large tooth is a question because that it does that suggest was the rest of the body in ratio to that tooth or was it just a large tooth in a strong jaw in a exactly. in a neanderthal or sapiens like like sized like a robust robust australopithecine correct yeah so but that's a big difference it was either right. a very a very unusual homo representative with an with a different yeah. jaw ca- capacity and niche graminov- graminovorous or who knows right or or it was it could be more sapiens like but just a third bigger or who yeah. knows yeah. well the Very one the one clue was that little finger you the the finger bones you there doesn't seem to be a real size disparity there and so i i, I at least at, at the time although you know your point's well taken but at the time i was thinking well if the hand bones were were not uh, noticeably large than other um, you know um, archaic hominoids hominids excuse me hominids of that period then then maybe it was just bigger teeth just like with robust australopithecines i remember back when i was a student you know they were talking about gorillas and chimp kind of analogs but in reality the robusticity was entirely in the face and jaws the postcranials were almost indistinguishable between the robust and gracile forms they weren't much different in size one just had evolved this remarkable adaptation so it's kind of tempting to look at, you know, here's another split and the, and the, the cause of the split, the, the novelty of the one was a hypertrophy of the chewing apparatus for some dietary reason, or whatever. The jaw that was discovered in the cave of the Tibetan plateau uh, was robust in form, but not, not huge in size. But uh, uh, it'd be very interesting to see in the future what that area yields in terms of, uh, I mean, because the Chinese have got countless um, specimens and skulls and postcranial um, artifacts that they, they, they haven't attributed to species. They're not quite sure what they are. And right. um, now that they've, they've mapped some of the genome of the Denisovans, it'll be very interesting to see the relationship between those, what was going on in the Far East that, that long ago. Yeah, exactly. No, it's it's a fascinating field. I mean, it just really uh, uh, it it's so it's not just old dry dusty bones. It's such a dynamic story that just keeps getting more complicated and more more interesting in the in the uh, relationships. I just wish sometimes that people would be a little more objective and, and less sensational. Uh, you know, I, I get so tired, for example, of the. I mean the. The potential for genetic introgression is certainly real and has played a significant role. And um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in, in our evolutionary history as, as a species and, and as, a, as a clade, but it sometimes gets so over, overworked over or over uh, exaggerated in a hyperbolic way, because I always have to remind my students that, you know, look, there's a, a very small fraction. Yes, there were some very successful um, uh, and beneficial introgressions that spread rapidly through the population, but they trace back to rather isolated and infrequent, very infrequent um, exchange of genes. I mean, some as back as, you know, 165,000 years ago. So it wasn't like they, you know, because I always say, look, look at it from, instead of glass half full, look at it glass half empty. These species coexisted in Europe and Western Asia for potentially as much as 40,000 years. Yes, indeed. And at the end of that 40,000 years, you could still identify a Neanderthal skull and a Homo sapiens skull. They were still different. They hadn't, you know, uh, blended and run in together and to, uh, without any further distinction. Indeed, which speaks to the difference in reality. If you could be a fly in the wall to right. see that relationship, like a you, you read Clan of the Cave Bear by Jean oh, M. Sure. Hall and similar, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the fly. She did. I mean, <laughs> that, that's one woman's work of fiction, but I thought she did an amazing job, especially for the period, to paint that picture. Sure. How, um, but point being, to be a fly on the wall and and to witness that relationship between sapiens and Neanderthals, like you said, forty thousand years potentially of living in the same region. 
right. but obviously occupying different enough niches and physical appearance, characteristics, right. culture was significantly different enough to cause them to stay pretty well apart Absolutely. most of the time. And, and that and that makes you wonder. I mean, because you know it's always been tempting, and uh, it's been suggested by many of you know my Russian counterparts, or at least the. I mean, they're not necessarily anthropologists, but the investigators of of, of hominology <clears throat> to connect the dot between the dots between Neanderthals and the Russian Almas, the Almas. Yeah. And uh, you know, when you read some of these archaeological papers where there are are occupation sites that have of, of Neanderthal that have no evidence of controlled use of fire for tens of thousands of years sometimes. Mm-hmm. There are some stable isotope analyses of the dentition of Neanderthals that suggest that they had a uh, a uh, strictly carnivorous diet. One hundred percent eat eating. So you put those Incredible. two together and the and the environment that the weather, the climate rather, excuse me, not weather, the climate that they uh, lived in, how as a Hominin, do you survive in in a paraglacial uh, environment with no fire <laughs> and and eating therefore eating raw meat as your sole source of uh, of uh, nutrient? You got you, you, the options are you've got you can eat meat, you can hunt and eat meat, or you can chew on pine leaves or similar, right. you know, or <laughs> dig down into the snow to eat lichen like a reindeer or something. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I want I'm I got in a lot of trouble for making that exact same point on a video I made and um, huh. suggesting that the the immediate it, 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 at least just superficial appearance or morphology of a Neanderthal could be very different to what we've seen in the last couple of decades with you know yeah. national geographic or similar yes. painting them as very 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 sapiens like oh i know yeah and, and all i did was suggest that you know they could have looked completely different and of course in today's political climate that was tantamount to all sorts of i know you know <laughs> politically incorrect um yeah faux pas but well uh, yeah but and yet and, it makes a very uh I think a much more interesting, uh, you know, ecological and evolutionary scenario to consider, and and yet again, like I said, you have to address if if they were kissing cousins, um, how is it that they? Why were they so repulsive <laughs> yeah. for the most part? And why was the gene flow only one direction? That's the other thing. Now there are some genetic mechanistic uh, possibilities for that, but if you take it at its face there were only male Neanderthals contributing uh, genetic material to human Homo sapiens females. Not the other way, or no evidence of, of any successful uh, pairing the other way around. So that, that's an interesting. I do wonder how consensual those couplings were. Well, exactly. I mean, I, you can't help but wonder, you know, come up with little scenarios in, in your mind that uh, would also be the stuff of the, uh, science fiction novels i suppose but indeed what? indeed the work of uh was it robert e howard and the old conan stories yeah. come to mind there are papers on the relict hominoid inquiry um pertaining to the caucus region like russia and all through right. like the kazakhstan the stans and and further west right um and and they're remarkable some of again it's anecdote but some of the 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 stories seem to suggest that go back a couple of generations even and the 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 existence of these these beings these creatures was kind of common knowledge not not that everyone saw them or that they were frequently even discussed but their presence was like it it, it it's actually ain't no big thing yeah of course they're out there right and the stories of them you know being seen in the winter time and even occasionally raiding the winter stores etc yeah. that's it's a remarkable read i actually i strongly suggest people go have a look yeah even taken in as companions of sorts mm. uh, you know whether in a, in a <clears throat> maybe perhaps more of a semi-domesticated nature rather than than a uh, uh, you know a, a, a companionship, but um, uh, on even par. But yeah, it, uh, it it's really quite quite amazing, and um, and and it goes beyond the anecdote too, because I mean, um, Mary Jean Kaufman, we've been fortunate to have uh, actually a lot of her, some of her works translated into English and, and been she the uh, French writer 
Yeah, French Russian. Yeah, yeah Russian. French Russian. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she she was a physician and also a mountaineer, and you know, outdoor adventurer and uh, and really pioneered a lot of the research into the Almas in uh, in uh, in those regions of the Caucasus and other other mountain ranges there in the Balkans, I guess you'd say. But yeah. Um, but the point is, her, her research has produced a lot a, a good footprint uh, record. And so there, there's some remarkable footprints, which, uh, you know, I, I, if I just had to, uh, in, in a nutshell, describe them, they're Neanderthal-like. They, they have an arch, a low arch, and, and a broad splayed foot with splayed digits, but uh, suggesting a very robust body build. But they're very distinct from the Sasquatch type of footprint which also makes an appearance occasionally in the lore as well as the footprint uh, record of the Caucasus in particular. But, but the Pamirs, I mean, I've got examples of Sasquatch-like footprints that extend from uh, far eastern Russia down through southeastern Asia, up flanking the Himalayas, and then curling around on, onto the mountain ranges that fringe um, Mongolia all the way to the Caucasus. And it kind of peters out there. And that seems to be, and it has good, they have good um, ecological correlates of their distribution that suggest that that may have been the range of a large, uh, you know, giant bipedal hominoid, um, which we call Sasquatch over here, but goes by a whole host of names in, uh, in Asia. My line of work in regenerative agriculture, I've got, I've got a great interest in climatic analog and yeah. those kind of studies. And, they, they, it's been said that the beginning with the Balkans and moving into the Caucasus, that area looks, in terms of the, the retention of uh, wildness, I guess, it looks the way Western Europe looked, you know, a thousand years ago. Or right, more. right. And you can see yeah. the way those the, the sightings and uh, anecdote seem to stop fairly abruptly in terms of contemporary sightings and anecdote. Right. You go back to the phenomena of the likes of the Woodworths in in the UK and Western Europe and France. Right. Um, these a, a lot of church engravings and panelings and you know, um, in in books and and all sorts of even stories of these hair covered, mostly nocturnal, often mute, right. wild human like creatures that seem to I, I i don't have this in front of me but i i can't remember where i read it but i remember reading someone saying that evidence of them or sorry, suggestion of them seems to stop really abruptly around the time of the black death oh the great the great plague interesting yeah so i i do wonder the effects of the in terms of why homo sapiens are the last ape standing as it's been told uh, been as we've been called I do wonder if if think new world diseases and similar have any impact. Like when mm. the Black Plague went through Europe, the potential impact on a population of relic hominoids, or right. when Europeans got to North America, things like smallpox, the potential for that actually being decimating whatever population there was at the time. Right. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think that's a very real possibility. I think the, uh, you know, the one thing that might have uh, uh, spared Sasquatch from that to some degree, perhaps not entirely, but is is the uh, re relatively solitary um, uh, social structure that I I think they have, as indicated yes. by the isolated footprints of single individuals and most encounters of are with solitary individuals. So it may be that, you know. Uh, their their uh, congress was limited and sporadic enough that they didn't uh, suffer the brunt of a of a of a pandemic or an epidemic of, of those communicable diseases. But yeah, that's a yeah, good point. absolutely, actually, absolutely good point. Okay, Dr. Meldrum. Well, I won't keep you too much longer. Thank you for joining me. It was, a, as you said before, it was a kind of a surprise. With you thought it was tomorrow, I thought it was today. That's, that's right. the that's the international time difference for you. Um, before you go, I wanted to actually say a thank you to you. Yeah. As 
as an open-minded scientist who can retain a, a rigorous scientific objectivity while entertaining um, the possibilities and uh, and doing so with a, a, a real charm and chivalry and always being eloquent and um, polite and gentlemanly about it in a world where in a world where we're continually polarized and anyone with a different idea is almost criminalized to some degree now sure. and names are thrown and people seem to lose their uh, their ability just to maintain normal everyday manners through, across the internet you've always maintained a, um, an open mind with a level head and a very a gentlemanly way of carrying yourself and relating to other people so I wanted to thank you for that personally well, I appreciate you. That, that, that means a lot. And, uh, and if I've, if I've ever fallen short of that, uh, of that glowing review, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for that, but I, I, you know, strive for that. So it's much appreciated. Well, I've never heard or seen you fall short of it. So thank you for that. Okay. Pleasure. All right. I'll let you go, mate. Thank you. All right. You take care. All the best. Stay, stay in touch. If you come across any, any interesting, uh, tidbits that help to, Un unravel that knot down there, the Yowie knot. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I've got my eyes peeled. I'll let you know. <laughs> Cheers. Take care. See you, mate. Ta-da. We went to find the octarine tree For legends claimed it healed one's mind So off we pressed into the night With naught but guesses as our guide And though we drifted without sight Somehow we seem to drift toward the light We wandered wide in stiffened circles With mere glimpses of the past To carry others' names We lost a few upon the way And though our twisting made us tired A spiral softer than a light Must grow.